Hi, I'm Barry Kostrensky. Welcome. This is part of a artist talk dialogue that I'm doing. Uh, artists we gather. Right now we're gathering every Monday. Uh, this is August 22nd. We're going to start in September uh, going to Tuesdays and do it every week. Artists get to share 30 minute presentations. That's the format we've started with. Um, it's going to change. We're going to mix it up next week. Uh, it's a chance for artists who like to reach out and share five or 10 minutes about recent work. Um, I think that'll be a fun sort of a mixed gathering. Today we have Michael Comback. Oh, by the way, all previous talks are now on the my YouTube page. You can access that through my website, or it's basically my name. If you put that in underneath YouTube, you'll see. And it's nice to say a lot of the talks are getting a lot of views. Um, today we have Michael Comback, and I got to admit, you know, the last five or six talks they really are individual artists. There is no link intended, but if you see or listen to the talks and see the images, there's no question about it, there is a link. And the point being that artists are linked whether you know each other or not. We're linked by materials, by ideas, by how we approach things, by so many things. And I think that's one of the nice things. I won't say much about Michael and I'll be frank, I don't know much about him. But when I've watched his work for maybe the last, I don't know, eight or 10 years since by chance my daughter was at University of Delaware and I checked it out, I've been fascinated and a fan. And it's, as I often say, it's a pleasure to see a works, an artist's work evolve. And I don't mean evolve in the like up sense of a ladder. I mean, evolve across in different ways. And, you know, there, there is Michael in everything he does. And Michael, a pleasure. Thank you for taking your time and for uh, joining us and to share. And again, thanks to everybody for coming. Welcome, Michael. <clears throat> thanks for having me. Yeah. So I'll, I'll jump into my, uh screen saver here all right all right does everybody see richard rorty and air guitar and a little drawing all right so mm -hmm. i was saying to barry that i have a <clears throat> kind of a combination of of talks and slides and oftentimes am am not really asked to speak much to my community uh, much to my studio work because my work in the community really um, you know, really captures the imagination of a lot of folks. I'm the founding director of a program called the Creative Vision Factory. This past December, we celebrated our, our 10 year anniversary. And the Creative Vision Factory is a drop-in art studio that's funded by the state of Delaware's uh, Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. And so um, it's a really cool program that um, was born out of a lot of the work that I was doing in the city of Wilmington shortly after graduating from, uh, from the University of Delaware MFA program. I uh, left that MFA program in uh, what was then our um, kind of a once in a generation uh, recession of the spring of 2008. And so I'm a proud survivor of multiple recessions in my short career. <laughs> Just saying to Barry here earlier that I, uh, Today has been a little bit of a mixed uh, kind of uh, heartbreak as well, because I was a finalist for a uh, tenure track painting and drawing position at Delaware State University. And I was just informed that my good friend Joshua Nobling beat me out for the job. So it's been kind of like mixed emotions. I'm super glad that another uh, uh, University of Delaware MFA got this job. You know, Josh has really put in his time, but I was also really excited about what was going on to Delaware State University campus. And, uh, you know, so on to the next. I used to keep a real big binder of all my rejections to, to show students and actually had the series of drawings that I did over top of my uh, uh, first round rejection letters for graduate. And so um, uh, this talk, you know, Richard Rorty and Contingency, Irony and Solidarity was a book recommendation that was given to me. Uh, during my very last studio visit at graduate school, uh, the artist Buzz Spector uh, came into my studio and right off the bat, uh, he won my heart by asking me, he said, Michael, has, has anybody written about your work? And as soon as he said that to me, I just was like, I just melted in this guy's arms because I was never, no one ever asked me that question before. And um, you know, so in my conversation with with Buzz, you know, I think he got a distinct sense of the work that I was really kind of uh, committed to in terms of my community work, but I was also kind of struggling with kind of uh, making my my studio practice, which is very much process based and, and dealing with abstraction, kind of speak to these larger concerns. 
And that first year out of graduate school, reading a contingency irony and solidarity was a real trip for me because I had this like amazing second year of graduate school where I was paid to just make work in the studio. I didn't have to teach any classes. I was just making work. And all that came to a grinding halt within two weeks of my um, thesis exhibition. Uh, my wife and I uh, had our first our first baby. And so my, my son Thurman was born like right at the end of this uh, experience. And then I started working at the Delaware College of Art and Design shortly thereafter. And so that first year out of graduate school, not having a studio, uh, being sleep deprived, having a baby, trying to, you know, you know, I was grateful to be in the art world, but I was definitely, I was in the admissions office at the Delaware College of Art and Design. You know, it's a, it, was, it was quite some year. Uh, but during that year, you know, I got, uh, um, you know, I realized what Buzz was kind of speaking about when he had me read that Richard Rorty book. And I think a lot of the, uh, the work that I've been involved in since has, um, has really been informed by, you know, a, a lot of reading, but also a lot of, uh, a lot of organizing. Uh, you know, organizing my fellow artists and peers in the city of Wilmington. You know, when I came here, there wasn't much of a contemporary art scene, but we had, uh, you know, lots of buildings, lots of properties, lots of you know, stuff to get into. And I started organizing exhibitions with my friends. You know, um, this is a, a artist statement from the Artist Collective Temporary Services. They used to have a, uh, a press arm called Half Letter Press. And so I ordered a bunch of materials from them and they included this mission statement in this package. This sign has, has hung in every single office that I've ever had since leaving school. And uh, you know, my early work of organizing my fellow peers, organizing shows and vacant properties throughout the city of Wilmington kind of led to this uh, you know, job that I have now leading this, this uh, state contract uh, program to create a vision factory. You know, Delaware, every, everything is like, a, you know, the, the separate degree of separation is always by one degree. Um, it's been a really cool place to, to kind of think and work, but also since graduate school, I, I very much feel like, um, you know, I'm kind of living a kind of gentrification textbook because um, our, our program right now is facing pressure from a hundred, a hundred, 202 unit luxury apartment complex is being built right next to us. And uh, we're definitely in our last year at our current lease. Um, these are some images from, um, you know, unfortunately last year we, uh, at the Creative Vision Factory, we lost one of our dear uh, staff members, uh, Michael Solomon. And so uh, if you Google Creative Vision Factory, you'll probably find like a really short video on, on YouTube that tells the story of our agency and our work and our mission, but through the story of Michael Solomon. Uh, this piece on the left is this really great um, mosaic tile piece by Joyce Kozloff that's in the Wilmington train station. And so this, uh, this tile mosaic is kind of a launch point for a lot of Creative Vision Factory public artworks where we make a, a lot of uh, you know, tile mosaic murals throughout the city. This is a, a little project we did at the Delaware State Hospital. Um, this work kind of takes us into the New Wilmington Art Association. This is a, the artist collaborative that I, that I founded right out of graduate school. And these are some of the properties in downtown Wilmington that we were organizing exhibitions through. Uh, this works, you know, led to the uh, my involvement with the Chris White Community Development Corporation, which developed this building, uh, Shipley Lofts. It was Delaware's very first artist live workspace. Eighteen of the twenty-three artists, 18, 18 of the twenty-three units that are in this building are subsidized for low-income artists. And so, a lot of the work that I was doing, organizing shows throughout the city, got me involved with this community development corporation. And it happened at a really cool time where I got to learn all the ins and outs of how a, a building like this gets financed, uh, the various tools that went into it. Uh, you'll see in this picture in the bottom left that this is just a, a shell of a building. We were able to secure historic tax credits to preserve the exterior of the building, and kind of JVing those tax credits with the <clears throat> low income tax credits for the affordable rents you know, made the building possible. But just a couple doors uh, down from, from this building is the Creative Vision Factory. And, uh, this is on the right here. This is a uh, Fletcher Oman Gallery director Alex Baker looking through some of the work of one of our artists, Geraldo Gonzalez. And if you had asked me back in 2011 when we opened the Creative Vision Factory what success looks like, I would have told you that 
you know, one of our artists would be in the outsider art fair and somebody would have a big write up in, um, in raw vision. And um, in January, 2020, one of our artists, Geraldo Gonzalez, who's gonna be featured here, here on the left, uh, he got picked up by Kolsch Gallery out of Houston and was featured in their booth at the Outsider Art Fair. And he also had a, a big story in Raw Vision that actually premiered the, the night that that fair opened. And so um, I think hanging out with Geraldo that night at the Outsider Art Fair really kind of got to see that, you know, this little program that we created um, of creating like a really inclusive studio across the disability spectrum was already having some pretty big impacts. And uh, it was super cool to see, you know, Geraldo, when he first met me, he had uh, an artist uh, that I know, the abstract painter, Ellen Priest is a next door neighbor of his. And she caught wind that I was gonna be opening up this kind of dis disability spectrum art studio. And she had Geraldo meet me at, at an exhibition that I was organizing in town. During that time period, I'm reviewing a lot of portfolios at the Delaware College of Art and Design, and I was really accustomed to students kind of like being nervous with their portfolio around me. And uh, this guy, when he showed me all of his drawings, he, he told me that he had been sending the drawings to the Delaware Art Museum and the Delaware Center for Contemporary Art, and no one ever got back to him. And so that, that night, looking at all of his drawings and just how cool they were, you know, filled with hyperbole, I said, you know, Geraldo, you know, by the time we're done, You'll have shown over, you've, you'll have shown at those places multiple times and then some. And uh, you know, it was a really cool night right before the pandemic hit to be at the fair with him. You know, we had a couple board members uh, paid for our train rides and I rode the train up to New York City with Geraldo. And uh, it was such a cool day to get out of town, but also to, to see that, you know, due to our relationship with Fleischer Oldman Gallery, um, it was like we arrived at the out, outsider art fair and we were instantly at the cool kids table. It was just, uh, it was such a cool experience. And uh, really the, what we've been through during the pandemic has really tried to, has really driven home that we need to get back to that place. Um, you know, so that was a, kind of the high point before the pandemic hit and uh, I'll skip, a, skip ahead, you know, when the pandemic hit, uh, this was the front of our studio building in Wilmington, Delaware. You know, we had a, um, in that, we always knew that about half of our membership was experiencing homelessness, but after the stay at home order took place and we got to see a lot of our members outside the glass doors looking in, uh, we immediately started to uh, survey people. We immediately launched a mutual aid campaign. And as you can see in this picture here, we created this makeshift charging station posted our Wi-Fi password and, and Wi-Fi network on the front glass and instantly started surveying people about where they were staying, if they would accept a hotel voucher, if they were given one, and uh, what their top three needs were in terms of donated materials. And so um, in those first few days, we started ringing every alarm bell in the state to try to figure out if, if there was a plan to, to house all these folks. And of, of course, we found that there, there was not. And uh, by the time the middle of April rolled around, we were able to get 120 people off the streets and into uh, temporary hotel stays. And so Michael, Michael yeah. I've got to cut in. It's, you know, it's great to have you here as an artist. Yeah. And we had an artist talk last time and he talked about working with artists and how he collaborates. And we also had another artist, Melody Provenzano, stay the same. And, you know, you've taken it to another level. Uh -huh. You've sort of galleries, you've gotten people, you've, you've reached beyond the traditional artist. You know, you, you, you've done so many beautiful things, I can't summarize. But let me ask you, what's, how'd you get here? I mean, is this something were your family advocates? I mean, how did how did this happen to you? We, we'd all like to be doing this. And I will say, you, you said something very true. You don't know how what you do touches and impacts people and what they do next. We have limited sight. So when you occasionally get to see and realize, wow, someone got into this. Someone, I got news for you. Other artists, you don't know, but you did touch their lives. And it's a, quite a beautiful and respectable thing what you do. But How'd you come, you know, you're not playing football, you're not a receiver, you know, so how, how'd you get here? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I think that um, 
you know, the way I got here, you know, I, I always, um, you know, I, I thank my mom for, um, you know, really encouraging me in the arts. Um, but at the same token, uh, she was also a really cool model of, of support uh, just in the community, living, living with my mother. I'll, you know, as a, as a young kid, I was living with a full-time advocate around the clock, an advocate for the arts, but also an advocate for uh, countless, countless young women. When I was in second grade, my mother was involved in a, a, a DUI crash where I was in the car with her. And at that crash actually got her into recovery. And, and so my, you know, my childhood had from, you know, from ages zero to that point was filled with a lot of turmoil, you know, a, a divorce, uh, you know, my mother's alcoholism, a bunch of, you know, I always tell people like, I don't, I don't need to watch the movie Hillbilly Elegy, you know, cause I, I lived a big portion of that. Uh, me and my cousins, you know, we, we don't have to watch that movie. We lived it. But, um, my mother, uh, in her recovery, immediately, uh, you know, was able to finish her degree, uh, immediately started teaching, but also immediately became really active in the recovery community. And basically out of, out of our many apartments was basically running like a halfway house. Most, most of my childhood, you know, I always knew that we were, you know, supporting other people and, and my mother's kind of commitment to service was definitely born out of her wellness. Uh, she was also an artist and, and an art teacher and, and the art room for me, you know, I, you know, I didn't realize or I didn't have a language for it, you know, um, but I spent just huge amount of times in the art room as a kid. And, um, and when, by the time I came to high school, um, you know, I really saw myself as a, as a serious artist, but that space itself, is just a place that I really felt comfortable, felt at home. And, um, What's wild for me is that, you know, shortly after I graduated from, from undergrad, I, I got a studio art degree from Bloomsburg University in Pennsylvania. I ended up um, landing a high school teaching job in Virginia. And um, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, was the French teacher at that school. And I was the high school art teacher. And uh, during that time period, I also got to be the assistant baseball coach for the varsity baseball team. And and for me, it felt like I got to go back to school and do it all over again. You know, my, my first, I'll say my, my first senior year of college is when I myself went to rehab. And my second senior year was my very first year clean and sober. And so when I, when I left uh, undergrad and ended up landing this high school teaching job, I wasn't that far, um, I wasn't that much older than the students that I was working with. But I also was really kind of not that far from a pretty dark place in my life. Um, and just all of a sudden being in charge of like 120 high school students on the other side of the desk, I always knew how important that room was, how important it was to feel like I fit in, to feel like I belonged. But when I was on the other side of that desk, seeing other kids come into the room, I started to really realize that there's a, a greater service than just arts education that takes place in a high school art room, but a high school art room is, is like a piece of critical social infrastructure, uh, critical social infrastructure for people who may not feel that they belong anywhere. And uh, so it was really, it was a fascinating observation for me to see that. Um, you know, I spent the three years that I was teaching down there. I, I didn't have an education degree. I, I got, I was an emergency hire. So I had a, uh, just a three year temporary uh, teaching certification from state of Virginia. And I thought at, during that time period that I would, um, you know, use this um, opportunity to you know, get some teaching experience, but I definitely, you know, wanted to go to graduate school and kind of wanted to pursue a, a place in higher ed. And so ultimately, you know, that's what took me to the University of Delaware. But, um, you know, well, Michael, I, Michael, you certainly, you answered that very deeply and thank you for sharing yeah. uh, you know, those experiences, certainly, you know, the legacy of your mother's recovery and your recovery, you know, often in recovery and going through it, the best you can do is try and get out of yourself and help somebody. Um, you know, it's, it's a part of it. And both of you have obviously put a lot of that energy and, uh, you know, you've touched a lot of people and it heals you back as you heal. I notice whenever I try and teach drawing, 
I went somewhere that said, draw a nose. And I'm like, uh-oh. But since I had to focus on it so hard, I drew the greatest nose. So yeah. sometimes you, you, you bring out yourself in communication with somebody and by doing and helping. I mean, here's an example. You have a photo of people hugging. You know, this is not a traditional art installation. Well, and then too, it's like with this piece, I wanted to bring this up. Uh, this is actually, um, you know, our, our program, the Creative Vision Factory, was actually funded from a uh, Department of Justice lawsuit against our state state hospital for warehousing people and uh, for multiple violations of the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. And uh, a project that we set in motion shortly after the settlement agreement uh, was kind of set in motion and uh, Creative Vision Factory is just one of multiple peer run drop in centers that was established throughout the state, but it's the only one that utilizes the arts and art studio to do its kind of work and bidding. And this is a project, uh, William Slowick, the artist here on the right, and our, our guy Michael Solomon over here uh, that he's, he's hugging. This is in front of uh, the Delaware Psychiatric Center Spiral Cemetery Monument. And so the tiles back here are actually directory tiles that connect numbers to the names of the individuals that were buried there. The stones at that cemetery only ever had these numbers for, for quite a long time. I, the first person that was buried there is in the, like the 1890s. The last person that was buried at this particular cemetery was in the, the late 1970s. And so this project kind of, uh, you know, connected the numbers to the names, but again, started to retell a a, uh, a past where these stories, you know, these these individuals were only only ever had a number. And so connecting it to the name and connecting it to the stories, we found it's been a, a powerful advocacy tool for the folks that we serve, you know, while they're, you know, while they're navigating all kinds of structural inequality and structural violence while they're above ground. Um, the original monument that we created, however, uh, failed. Uh, the original tile that William made, he made it with a uh, donated kiln, uh, used the wrong clay body, and after one winter, the tile started flaking. And so this is uh, the redesigned monument here that we did as a part of a multi-site public artwork uh, collaboration with the Winter Tour Museum, where we did uh, uh, multiple public artworks throughout Newcastle County uh, utilizing upcycled materials. So a lot of the mosaic in this is, is tile that's upcycled from the Habitat for Humanity Restore. And, uh, and then we were able to get the uh, kind of the preservation experts at the Winter Tour Museum to kind of ride shotgun on this iteration of this rebuilt monument. And so um, it's, been a, it's been a cool collaboration of uh, folks who are local who know the Winter Tour Museum, you know, are usually kind of astounded that they're partnering with a uh, Behavioral Health Community Arts Center in downtown Wilmington, uh, but the uh, the researchers and workers, uh, the kind of the cultural workers at the Winter Tour Museum, have been close friends and collaborators of mine for quite some time, and it's just a quite a quite a jewel of a collection and a really cool place to be. Um, this project, however, you know, this is some of the floral tiles we made. Uh, we laid the we. Uh, made all these tiles at the Creative Vision Factory, but we also uh, stained them in workshops that we were able to create uh, throughout the county. And the large majority of the workshops we actually did at the Newcastle County Hope Center. This is my daughter and uh, my friend, Carrie Casey. The Newcastle County Hope Center was a uh, CARES Act funded hotel that was purchased with uh, by our county executive with CARES Act money that was able to house a very large uh, number of the people that we were initially got off the streets right after the stay at home order. Uh, that summer when we reopened with number restrictions, we ended up, um, you know, we thought we did such a great job of getting all these people off the streets. And then by the time we reopened under our number restrictions and masks, we started hearing the stories of people who are getting kicked out of the hotels. And so, um, you know, thanks to the kind of connectivity of Delaware and the Delaware way, I was able to kind of collect all these stories. And with a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Steve Matro, who is a, a director of the Biden School at the University of Delaware, he's also a homelessness researcher. We were able to 
uh, hold focus groups with 65 individuals that we help place in the emergency hotels. And we were able to kind of able to hold these focus groups for the county as they're getting ready to open up this big shelter so they could be prepared for what they were going to be faced with as soon as they opened on day one, the unique challenges that were people were bringing in. Uh, this bench here is actually right in front of the Newcastle County Hope Center, and it's one of the three benches that we made in partnership with Winter Tour. All the tile that's on front of this bench commemorates our, uh, our dearly departed uh, staff member and friend, Michael Solomon. Uh, we commissioned uh, the artist Hope Hummingbird to do this portrait. Uh, Hope Hummingbird is originally based out of Philadelphia. Uh, that's not her real name. That's her anonymous uh, street name. But I, I've never met an anonymous street artist who works in ceramics. And so uh, in, in around Kensington neighborhood of Philadelphia, you, you'll see a lot of blue hummingbirds that are kind of just like glued to sides of buildings. Uh, Hope Studio is now uh, based out of Austin, Texas. We had her uh, make an additional portrait under this commission. Uh, but these, uh, you know, part of this upcycle project, we upcycled tile from the Habitat for Humanity. That's what creates this pattern on top. And, and then these other tiles on this where we did a little scraffito workshop at the Hope Center and had people, uh, you know, think about kind of messages of what, you know, what home means to them. And, you um, and it was pretty cool. And, and two, it was, it was cool for, for me to, to be working there with my daughter. You know, during the time period at the shelter, um, a lot of the kids could zoom into their classes from the hotel. And so I, I went there and we did a lot of these tile workshops. And my daughter just was in Zoom classes with other kids who were actually living at the, at the uh, Hope Center and helped me facilitate these workshops when she was not in class. This is another Hope Hummingbird commission. We had her uh, do the Michael Solomon portrait, but this portrait of Alice Dunbar Nelson is a, um, a, a little known uh, black writer uh, who was based in Wilmington. She moved to Wilmington after leaving her alcoholic and abusive husband, Paul Dunbar, the uh, kind of the poet of Harlem Renaissance fame. And Alice Dunbar Nelson was just incredibly politically active here in Wilmington. Uh, uh, helped secure the women's right to vote, uh, but also, uh, you know, as a writer, playwright, journalist, and the University of Delaware has all of her uh, original notebooks. And so a friend of mine, David Kim, who's an English professor at UD, we've been trying to, uh, you know, really raise the awareness of Alice Dunbar Nelson's impact and the legacy of her research and her work on Wilmington's East Side. And this is a some recent tile that has come out of our studio, uh, some pictures from my, from my winter tour talk. One of the things that I've loved uh, coming out of the pandemic and all this access that I have to the winter tour museum is that you know, my work in Wilmington has just been pretty, it's, it's been a dumpster fire. You know, I tell people that you know, the, we are, our, our people are already navigating a disaster before the pandemic hit. The pandemic is just really kind of, just really amped things up. And uh, for me to have uh, the kind of the access that I do at the winter tour, so I have a, a pass now that enables me to use their research library and I can go to the grounds whenever I want. Is I often walk uh, the 60 acre wild, uh, wild country garden that's around the building. And it reminds me of this place that I um, kind of grew up in. You know, there's uh, me and my mom when I'm little. This is shortly after the divorce. We moved in with my grandparents who at the time, were the caretakers of this place called Chestnut Hill Farm uh, outside of Somerset, Pennsylvania. Chestnut Hill Farm is the very next exit next to the main entrance of Seven Springs Ski Resort. And so as a little kid, I spent a large amount of time being at this place alone, surrounded by uh, ski houses that were owned by very wealthy people who were like hardly ever there. My grandfather, who worked 30 years at Edgar Thompson Steel Plant in Braddock, Pennsylvania, was uh, the caretaker of this place. And, and just thinking about that time period, like he and my grandmother, just the life that they had lived to, to be in this kind of like beautific place with their grandson running around, you know, no wonder, uh, you know, despite all the early childhood trauma, no wonder I was just filled up with such love and safety at this place. And when I rediscovered this kind of the wild garden 
the Winter Tour Garden. The Winter Tour Garden feels like a, a portal to Chestnut Hill Farm. And this place that I, I, I'd spent so much time kind of just being, you know, this is where I kind of learned to be alone. And I think that too, kind of thinking about reflecting on my kind of practice and, you know, my position in the art community, but my work as an artist, I feel like largely has been kind of grappling with that question of just, you know, simply how to, how to be alone, you know, how to be with oneself, how to busy oneself, um, you know, drawing and making and tinkering and, and playing has always just been, it's always been there. And looking back, you know, I can now see that, you know, this was always an adaptive behavior for me that, that helped with underlying anxiety, stress, worry, uh, but also, uh, a deep tradition that was connected to all the artists and musicians in my family and their stories. Um, you know, it was at this place where I was filled with all those stories. You know, let's say, you know, uh, my, I give my mom a lot of credit, but I also give my Irish grandmother a lot of credit for making me think I could do anything and kind of giving me all the space in the world. And, uh, you know, this place has been a really cool place for me to kind of reconnect. But also, too, when I think about the work that we do. The work that I do with unhoused artists, you know, people don't get well until they get housing. It's not rocket science, you know, and, and so the thing that we've seen over 10 years of doing this work is that when people get well, it's, they usually have, you know, three things baked into their life. They usually have a home, they have some sanctuary, and they have a purpose. And being able to really kind of you know meditate on the importance of home, sanctuary, and purpose. Uh, you know, I know for me, getting through some of these really rough times in the pandemic and seeing some really uh, some hardships um, up close and personal. You know, kind of the smell of being unhoused, uh, the, the trauma that people kind of constantly bring into our doors that they're working through in the studio. Um, you know, it, it can be a lot to carry. You know, so for me, you know, the, the art practice has always been a place where I've been able to fill my cup. You know, it's always been very akin to my meditation practice. And Michael, so, let me ask you, what kind of things did you draw when you were younger? All kinds of patterns, all kinds of designs, uh, cars. Uh, you know, uh, I had friends of mine in school where we would, um, we'd also, uh, we had this book of characters of creatures that we would pass around and everybody kind of added to it and um so there's a lot of drawing you know going on right from the jump uh, i love i love this tile here this graffito tile from the uh, uh this is from bucks county this is from henry mercer's house called fawn hill castle and it says says shiver no more but like how it shiver is kind of baked in here it, it feels like very like I don't know, it just feels like a, a piece of graffiti. It feels like a little piece of, of writing and- uh, Oh, but almost almost Celtic and like where the letters are so uh, Gothic, you can't sort of uh, get them. Very yeah. nice. Michael, are you gonna hold off to the last minute to show us some of your own work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just kind of scooting past here, to some stuff. So this is a, a bench that we did and uh, to kind of connect it back to my family. This is a, a, a note that's written to my Aunt Mary from my great aunt, Ann Martin, who is the, She's the visual artist in my family who was famous for, for leaving the convent to go uh, live with her lover in Pittsburgh. And she taught high school art for her whole career. And she bought my very first painting for me for like three times the amount that I was asking. Had it, had it framed really nice and then like gifted it back to my mom. But this is a little note that she uh, that connects to this uh, piece that I was able to insert of Anne's into uh, a handmade tile that I made here at the Creative Vision Factory. And this tile, uh, these handmade tiles were directly pulled from that mu museum trip to Fawn Hill Castle. And we utilized broken dish shards. So this is a broken dish from my wife and I's wedding. Uh, this is from my great aunt, Ann Martin. And uh, we also got a plate from my good friend, Ashley Biden, who actually, you know, just drove to her parents' house in Wilmington and took this off of a shelf. And so this plate is pulled from the vice president's residence and uh, made its way into our little bench project right there. And so uh, 
the handmade tile and and you know kind of this bench now kind of sits out there a winter tour and it's kind of like a uh, it's an embodiment of the Delaware way because there's just so many relationships and different families that are enmeshed in this bench and I just love the fact that I've been able to bake in all my 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 great my great Irish aunts and my grandmother are right there in between the the president's tile and there's my son um, but yeah I wanted to hop out uh, this is a um, you know, more projects of that bench, but here's, 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 here's what ultimately happened with the rebuild of the cemetery project is that it failed again. And this, and this time, you know, I felt a little bit better about it having my friends in the, you know, world renowned art conservation and preservation program at Winter Tour helping me on this. But what we had here was an, an adhesive failure. And uh, we're actually going to be rebuilding this here uh, next month. And, and possibly even kicking it into the spring, but it was kind of devastating. And uh, I feel like um, one of the things that uh, our friends from Winterford just said about it is like, well, you know, uh, I'm glad we have really good notes and we'll just try again. <laughs> and uh, and I'm, I'm certain that I know with a, a lot of our tile projects too, that each one of these failures <clears throat> usually leads to like, some kind of breakthrough or a new understanding. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's really unfortunate. We feel like, you know, no one has ever gotten it right by these souls that are on the, at this ground, but we're gonna keep on trying. And, um, and this was like a, a lovely piece that, you know, my dear friend, Hope Hummingbird throughout this whole, whole journey, this is just a, a leather piece of hers that you, if you see it around, you'll know that it's from an anonymous street artist. <laughs> But when you see this, get, you know, gather the people you trust and support and then resist. You know, it's just a, a cool kind of call to arms. Um, so the, um, it was funny, this, uh, I'll describe this slide real quick. You know, as a Delaware celebrity, I was invited to pr participate in the Dancing with the Delaware Stars at an event celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Wilmington Library this year. And so that's a picture from that event. Our membership at the Creative Vision Factory absolutely loves watching this video of my performance. We, we uh, came into, me and my friend Sarah, we came in, uh, we were runners up by a single vote. And so it's given us a really great bragging rights throughout the city. But I was uh, also, you know, our membership loved it because I was the only white guy participant. And apparently I really showed up. So they, they absolutely adored it. And um, I have as well, I'm sure if you can still see my screen here. We can, we can. So I have an exhibition coming up. Um, so the exhibition is gonna be featuring uh, all my new paintings, but also these, these drawings. And these drawings, I, I call them the Hangoutology Doodles. And I've been working on these doodles for a very, very long time. And I actually always keep one in progress in my office and on me, you know, most times. Uh, I, um, this is a little like kind of technique. I have one right in, in progress right now. And, and so as I'm working on these, I'm usually on the floor of the Creative Vision Factory. And it's actually being able to sit down and do something that I don't really have to, think about too much is a way for me to actually uh, kind of not be so hyper vigilant on the floor of the creative vision factory you know any any given day we have a lot of uh, traumatic things kind of play off here um, in the 10 year history of our program i've i've done four narcan overdose reversals three of them have taken place in this past fiscal year alone um, you know People are experiencing extreme states uh, that brings big emotions with it, big reactions. And having, um, having something that I can immediately sit down with so that, that kind of slows me down a bit um, usually helps me be a little less reactive in that situation. And so these doodles have been a way for me to kind of just uh, practice like mindfulness on the floor, but also kind of practice um, this little thing that I've kind of learned in my kind of uh, Zen literature of, of the practice of not doing. And oftentimes just being in proximity with one another 
you know, being with people can be the most important thing. But also, you know, these doodles kind of really help me kind of center, like slow down, feel my feet on the ground, be present. But at the same token, uh, you know, events from the pandemic also uh, <clears throat> kind of gave me more time to rediscover this. And so what's going to be cool about this show is that uh, the group of paintings that I'm showing, uh, they've never been shown together here in Delaware. This is actually a, a show that's been canceled one time before. I had a, uh, an exhibition at the uh, Little Rock, Arkansas's The New Gallery, and uh, had it scheduled to uh, show that work from Little Rock along with the drawings, and, and COVID canceled it. And so now I'm going to be showing everything that I've made since, since that time period, but also these, uh, these doodles have kind of taken on like a different meaning because they also kind of mark um, kind of my time throughout the pandemic. And early on too, I feel like um, this is kind of right where things kind of came to a grinding halt. And so this is one of my very first uh, kind of pandemic era doodles. This one is on a piece of stationery from uh, Bob Dole, who at the time period of this piece of paper was the majority leader of the Senate. And so um, being here in Delaware, being you know, close to, uh, you know, working with Ashley Biden, I feel like I've had this really weird kind of front row seat to kind of democratic politics over the past, <clears throat> however many years I've been in Delaware. But um, uh, my, Michael, Alyssa Pritzka asked about materials. I, I see marker and pen, yeah. usually marker and pen. Yeah, on these, a lot of marker and pen. And then too, it's been, you know, kind of fun, just kind of, um, some of them too incorporate some colored pencil and uh <clears throat> the colored pencil works too <clears throat> when i was a uh, when i was in high school i was making a lot of kind of like automatic drawings with colored pencil that would just be playing around with like various color palettes and so coming back to these drawings felt like kind of like a return to a kind of like an original practice of mine were you michael were you a mad magazine reader i was not i was not no, I, uh, I was not a Mad Magazine reader, uh, but I was always, um, I mean, growing up in Somerset, Pennsylvania, um, it's really rural. We don't have much to do. Uh, if you're involved in the arts, uh, I learned really quickly that on first Fridays, the Andy Warhol Museum would not card. <clears throat> so like me and my friends would like drive to Pittsburgh and go to the Andy Warhol Museum and like get served and like hang out. <clears throat> <laughs> That's where you know, a, lot, a lot of my uh, kind of high school days were kind of like spent on that scene. Um, but then too, I was also a huge fan of uh, my you know, kind of time in Pittsburgh. Uh, our, one of my favorite museums there is the Mattress Factory, uh, kind of a little installation art um, <clears throat> museum there that has, they have a Yeyo Kusama piece that was really influential on me early on, which then turned into me discovering her original infinity net paintings, which just like, I fell in love with that. And so, um, you know, kind of the, the art scene in Pittsburgh, you know, via this Warhol story and then through that mattress factory kind of opened up a whole, uh, all kinds of various practices and, and other artists I was immediately into. But Kusama was always a, uh, you know, somebody who's been like one of my, you know, big anchors. I've always been responding to her work and then too that, that kind of comes into to, you know the use of the dots and um but i think then too you know learning more about her work and the, the work that i eventually am doing uh with the creative vision factory is this kind of um kind of zone of you know of being kind of radically inclusive and creating and supporting an infrastructure that can sustain practices and the idea that you know she's been able to live out you know most of her days in the supports of a supportive infrastructure through the, you know, Japan's kind of like mental health infrastructure and just all the supports that she's kind of had to keep this vision going. You know, um, it's been wild working in proximity with so many artists that have a compulsion to make and how this compulsion to make. And, uh, you know, a lot of the creative vision factory artists like myself are, are very prolific, make a ton of work. You know, I, I see a lot of, see a lot of commonalities with how, you know, how, uh, you know, the work itself and uh, the process is really restorative. And, um, you know, you see, 
you know, having the practice and being engaged with community keeps people connected. I really feel like then too, it's like a lot of people in, in, in Delaware, I feel like they want to talk to, about our work of the importance of, you know, expressing oneself or, you know, having, you know, people see you at a show and, and what that means to you, to you in terms of, you know, your kind of recovery and, and inclusion. But I, I think it's just re also really important just, you know, the, the skills of an artist are just like basic agency, you know, like the, what we can do makes us agents. We make things, we can present things, we can you know, not just make uh, objects, but we can also make things happen, creating spaces. And so you know, I, I see so much of, um, of my practice is you know, not only being in the studio and committed and you know, maintaining kind of membership to this kind of tradition, um, but really kind of like that half letter press artist statement. You know, I'm, I'm also really concerned with really creating supportive infrastructures for others and kind of disrupting this kind of uh, the differences in between various categories. You know, I, I really see that as being really irrelevant. Um, you know, all kinds of creativity. Um, it's just really uh, to be kind of honored and celebrated and supported. And, and you know, through, through uh, you know, I always know that, you know, having a practice for me always is, you know, gives me this ability to, to engage and be in community with others. But like I said, I really feel like it comes down to the ability to, to be agents and to, to make change. And you know, largely, you know, feeling a lot, you know, feeling powerless through this pandemic, you know, I, I, I really, um, you know, I love thinking of these drawings as just trying to will something to happen. You know, I have uh, a couple of these pieces so I have the Bob Dole piece, but I also have some stationery from uh, Senator Orrin Hatch. And I, I love that the Senate Republicans are featured on this because I feel like if there's any kind of magic or voodoo that needs to happen uh, in that institution, it, it does have to happen on that side of the aisle in that particular institution. And I do see these drawings as just really trying to like will us to another, another time or another place and really see the kind of... Uh, the ritual of sitting down on these things of just trying to like, you know, will something into existence, something else, something different. And um, yeah, so the stationery too, I have, I've picked up the stationery over the years. Um, you know, a lot of people assume that it's from my kind of uh, contacts within our Delaware legislation, but my, um, my wife's uncle is a long time, a material culture curator of the Senate, and uh, he retired uh, in spring of 2020. And you know, he ended his 40-year career cataloging items from January 6. And um, you know, just getting to know Scott over the years, you know, like he's always been an anomaly to me because he's 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 very much Christian, right? but he's also a big history nerd and he's a deadhead and he loves psychedelic art and being uh, married into this family. He's always been my like one guy that I can kind of talk to to kind of translate. And he, he's been a huge support of, uh, you know, not only my interest in the, in the Senate and in the Capitol, but then to all the supporting, you know, material culture um, from the Senate. We just, I, I just, you know, I'm starting to run out of, of capital stationery and with Scott's retirement, um, it might be time for me to start leaning on my uh, legislative friends here from Delaware. You can, you, can always, you can always photocopy a few pieces. We'll give you that. You sound like you want the original. I think that's a great idea. Your own sort of like talisman that you're making and that artists as agents for change. I think we all need a can of Michael right next to us that we can open up anytime and take a sip because you know, you're, you're so passionate about art in a large sense and about touching a lot of people and, you know, touching a lot of people who maybe we don't think about when we think about the art world. Um, so many beautiful thoughts. Uh, uh, Lily White asked, have you done a piece for Liz Cheney? Or no, that's not the kind of thing. You go, you go for the devil, straight <laughs> devil. <laughs> that's the magic. Yeah, it's uh, it's been wild, kind of like you know. Uh, I, I'm such a uh, I'm such a political junkie, and uh, 
<laughs> early on in my uh, in, in this past year, I've been uh, I also I read a ton, and uh, there's a, a book that I read earlier in the year called uh, Inflamed: The Anatomy of Injustice. And um, it's, a, it's about the kind of preponderance of autoimmune disorders and uh, kind of born out of the fact that our, our bodies are like, you know, just like rejecting our environments because they're, they're largely toxic. And um, in this book, uh, it was talking about the, 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 the power of stories to help complete stress cycles. And simply even hearing a story can help an individual complete a, 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 a cycle of stress. And so as I'm, as I'm reading this in, in this book in flame, suddenly you know, my reading practice of really dense political biographies started to come into like a different light. I started seeing, cause I, I love Robert Caro. I, I, I love the power broker. I love the, his LBJ series. Um, I've, I've read through all the LBJ volumes twice. Uh, Ron Chernow biographies, a Hamilton, George Washington, Grant, and uh, well, so I so I was close when I said Mad Magazine, right? I was very close. <laughs> close. <Yeah. laughs> very like, fun. Very funny, Barry. Very funny. Those, those stories, <laughs> like to me, are really you know like has has been such good medicine for me, like to to really hear these these stories. Uh, I also read a really great. Uh, book by a researcher who stitched together uh, all of Machiavelli's writings and, and, and put together a biography that like makes it read like it's in, in his time. And it was just really, it was just such a, you know, kind of in a pressure cooker trying to keep our program funded, navigating the politics of downtown Wilmington. We have a very pro real estate developer mayor that's trying to push us out. And, you know, being able to sit back and read these stories has definitely been kind of a restorative kind of way to get, kind of get back and stay in the work. Michael, I, I hear a lot of things in what you say, but one thing that jumped up before and again, and it makes me ask, have you ever thought of going the full political role yourself, becoming a statesperson, a congressman, you know, sort of going over to the dark side to work with dark dark Vader? Well, well one, of my, uh, one of my very close friends and collaborators um, is now our downtown state senator. And so together we, we created some years ago, we created this um, micro grant fundraising dinner called Wilmington Stir. And this was a, this isn't a novel thing. This is something that a group of artists in Chicago called Sunday Soup created. And it was a way of kind of like crowdsourcing projects where you get a bunch of people together, talk about your ideas. Everybody pays like 10 bucks for the shared meal. Everybody who paid votes on a project that they want to fund, and then they give, you know, whatever project wins, they give them all that cash. Well, uh, Tizzy and I, we created the Wilmington version of that. And, um, you know, so the STIR acronym stands for Sitting Together is Radical. And so we, we put on nine of these dinners. And every time we, it also turned into like a, a thing that Creative Vision Factory members help actually, you know, produce and put on we make mosaic bases for the tables and so yeah you know the answer to that question i feel like in delaware the other thing about delaware is that everybody's everybody's a lobbyist and then too everybody also you either know a campaign working on a campaign or have friends that are like in and around that tomorrow i'm actually going to be canvassing for um medina wilson anton who's a young state rep of ours who is the very first um um, very first Muslim woman representative in Delaware. And she's just been, she's been kicking much ass. And she's, uh, she's kind of trained out of the public policy school at the Biden school. And, you know, my friend Tizzy Lockman uh, as our downtown senator, I really see, um, you know, I, I really see a lot of the work that they do as a, as a form of art. You know, it, this is, you know, again, we are, you know, leadership is, uh, it's about, you know, ultimately, I see it's about making. It's about you know bringing you know making movements, bringing people together on things, and uh, that's uh, it's been a really cool side effect of the experience of all the community artwork. Um, I'm, I'm also really loving right now that like you know one of my heroes in the work, Rick Lowe, 
has a big show opening up same night of my opening here in Wilmington, but he's opening up at Gagosian. And I think that like Rick has always been a painter, but when people think of Rick Lowe, they think of Project Row Houses and they think about the success of Project Row Houses and he got his MacArthur Fellowship because of Project Row Houses. But I think that uh, what, I, what I love about Rick Lowe too is that the, the, like the very Monday after he got his MacArthur Fellowship is that his long held job at Project Row Houses was actually like posted. And I just like, I think it's a fantasy for all of us who are involved in community arts that are really on a ground level is that maybe someday <laughs> we'll be able to get our flowers for our studio practice. But until that happens, it's also just been a joy, just like I said, like focusing on, you know, the general arts advocacy, the important role that art has to play. And, you know, when I first took on this contract, you know, I really just desperately wanted something different that wasn't the admissions office at the Delaware College of Art and Design. You know, you know, we, we, we've too. seen this before. You know, yeah. creative artists have to go ahead and not break the mold, make the mold. And that's what you're doing. You're making your old mold. We had Brainerd Carey speak about this. And we've had many other artists, Larry, who was here before. You know, you, you set up something that's not there, whether it's to benefit you or you do it in a group or it's it becomes something for artists. And to some extent, that's what these talks are meant to be, to sort of bring people together. You know, you said something real important about talking and storytelling. A while back, I started to realize that's what we really do. Everything else is like superstructure. We really just, you think of it, people come, you come together and you talk. You're basically telling stories. It's abstract um, and it's quite fascinating. I think we have to accept our roles as that and, you know, sort of, uh, you know, enjoy or bathe in it, so to speak. No, I think um, so I, and that it brings me back to my, the title of my show that I'm going to have so much fun with because the, the gallery at Chris White Gallery is literally a block and a half away from the Creative Vision Factory. It is in the, the gallery of the building that I helped create and just, uh, you know, half a block down is Creative Vision Factory. And you're going to be using my uh, receptions as like some straight up lobbying for the Creative Vision Factory and our, our kind of plight that we're up against this year because we have to find the new building. And so there's going to be some like three dimensional chess and some real like, you know, class A community arts lobbying taking place on the floor of the gallery on September 9th and September 22nd. And, uh, and that's a big part of it. Like you said, Barry, it's like, you know, kind of getting people together. I always think about art shows and putting on shows. It's like thinking about who can I bring together in the same room? How can I get them talking? And then what will happen next? And that's kind of just been like the prevailing thought, you know, and it's been, it's been a fun way of going about community work, getting to know and supporting my friends. And uh, at the same token, um, you know, the opportunities always kind of flow back. Yes, yes. Let me open it up to some questions, Michael. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Monroe Hodder said, thank you so much, Michael. Love this window into your varied and interesting life. I'm going to stop the screen share for a sec. Stop participants. Uh, so we can all sort of see each other and uh, open it up to questions. First, I just want to thank you, Michael. That was a deep dive. Thank you. That, that was uh, that was quite rich, quite rich in thought, um, and uh, definitely worth a, a rewatch as well. It's a lot of points that sort of jumped out as at to me, but I, I think we all took in a lot. Um, you you simply put, you do for many, and you know you have the creative impulse, but it's more community creative. And you have, you know, you mentioned how you did stuff and then you had kids. And to some extent, I think the point was you got a little sidetracked from your art and then you went and then you did the Creative Vision Factory and to some extent got sidetracked from your own art, um, you know, which is, uh, which is what happens. You sort of follow the path, but you're running them both and they will all feed each other. The, another thing you can't miss in Michael's voice is the voice of a founder of an organization. I know this from having run an art gallery. You, it's like a birth, it's like an object. It's hard to explain, but you feel for it like a parent. And I see 
uh, Audrey shaking her head yes, because she's at a gallery, has a gallery. And it is just like a child is, it is all consuming. It really is. And you constantly went back to it. Now, 10 years in the life of an organization that Michael's been running is 100 years in another organization. I, I know this, you know, my multiple wasn't 10, it was like two or three. Um, and it's uh, your challenge, the uh, Clay Art Center in Porchester in New York here, you know, been around forever, 1955. They've got a building issue. It's not uncommon that, you know, it's everything. Restaurants have been around forever. You know, owning your space is ideal, obviously, but that, that's a whole nother story. I know you will come up with a solution, whether you'll get funding, or whether you'll do something that's totally out of the box and something happens. That I know. And I think you have the confidence too. And you know, you put people together, you've got a date coming, you know, you you have that focus. And that that's a lot. You know, believing in yourself makes something happen. Disbelief, you know, is sort of an impetus, sort of a magnetic opposite of sorts. Um, let me open it up to any questions and thoughts anybody has. Uh, mm -hmm. I will also say, I, I did want to mention, you mentioned meditation and your work has that look. It has that repetitive thing and a doodle opens you to another sort of world where you maybe go beyond thinking or go into a different kind of thinking. What kind of meditation do you do? Is it a daily practice? You know, are you on your head? Are you stressing the body? Are you relaxing and breathing? What's your sort of uh, go-to? I'm uh, well, I'm very, very promiscuous. I, I was brought into uh, meditation through TM, and uh, I was brought into TM through a David Lynch scholarship that I secured for me and all my staff at the Creative Vision Factory when we first opened. And um, so David Lynch Foundation paid for all of us to learn TM in that first year. Um, during the pandemic, however, <laughs> I've uh, I've discovered the uh, the Dharma talks of Norman Fisher through uh, his everyday Zen community out of San Francisco, and so over the years, you know, I've definitely like I started off with uh, TM, and and now I will take my meditation via all kinds of various mindfulness traditions, uh, incorporating a lot of walking, but I do do the 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 two twenty minutes a day, and. Uh, but then, you know, I'm finding it in so many other places. And I, I really feel like the, uh, the everyday Zen community has been a real backstop for me, particularly over the past like two to three years. And um, yeah, so I, 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 Norman. A, 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 a big thing in meditation, it's what I, when 20 minutes, I mean, you mean traditional sittings where you sit by yourself. Um, a big part of it is to try and get the feeling and doing of the meditation in real life, in a walk, when you're purchasing, you know, uh, milk or whatever it is to sort of bring it live to real life. Uh, that is often the goal. Um, so. I wanted to jump in on that because it was exactly where I was gonna go, uh, Barry, to talk about the meditation as also the part of making the dots and making the pieces that you, uh, have been doing, obviously, you said for years. Um, and by the way, before I continue, just thank you. That was quite the fascinating <laughs> adventure that we went through. And uh, and I'll also just share that I'm a major political junkie myself. Um, so I love what you're doing. But uh, the, that whole, uh, uh, just when you're making the drawings and you talked about, do you think of that just like the walk or you know, going to the store or living the moment, uh, do those all feel that way to you? And um, I can also see the Yayo Kusama influence. That's very obvious. And I know a few other artists who really get into that whole pattern and then the only other comment I've had is I see that you had like a period of time where you were putting words in, there's language. And of course we couldn't see it large enough to see what you were uh, saying in those type of drawings. And do you see a difference between the ones that are pure pattern versus the ones that have the language going on in them? 
Yeah, the um, what's interesting with the the ones with the language almost immediately kind of were um, felt like and served a purpose almost as like journaling. Yeah. And so then, too, it became kind of like a time for me to kind of note what, what was happening, what's happening that day in particular, what am I observing, what's going on, and uh, definitely kind of became a way to kind of mark <clears throat> the historic moment that we're, that we're moving through. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, too, uh, recently, uh, what I, I think that, too, uh, Barry was kind of talking about the difference between, like, the paintings and the, and the doodles is that the doodles is a kind of like a more kind of permissive, looser space, even though it is pretty like, still kind of like really tight and regimented, but it's a lot more flexible. And so for <clears throat> kind of like, for there to be room for text to come in and out, that's okay. Uh, the drawings too are all kind of like all morphing where uh, I'm still working on them and will work on them leading up until probably like next weekend. I'll just be able to start exhibiting what's up. But the most recent one, I have some um, some key terms that are actually written into all the bands. And then the drawing takes place over top of the, over the words. And so in that, in that piece, uh, the writing is uh, top secret SCI and Mar-a-Lago just repeated. <laughs> Pattern kind right. of <clears throat> we we are definitely say, going through crazy yeah. time. Okay, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I wanted to say that I post on the chat that your presentation was awesome and really honest. I I you know the honesty that it, the way that you talk it really you know makes worthwhile to be listening to you because you know that's it came many things from your heart and and really i appreciated that very much also well you don't know my work but many of these group know my work and you know your doodles are really on my alley and really wonderful i can i can see your meditation and i i kind of was meditating with you while i was looking at your work yeah. i mean i wish you a lot of success with your exhibition i think people will love your work i mean i'm kind of loving it myself i'm really looking forward to it i feel like uh it's it's kind of like attending your own funeral and uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing that too. well i will say funeral and reborn i can add it yeah i love that that's an interesting way of putting it. <laughs> oh, that, that is a great note to end on. Michael, this was great. Another round of applause. Michael, thank you so much. So much said and taken in um, and so well presented. presented. Thank you. Um, I'll probably have this talk up within the week, probably sooner. I'll have it on the YouTube uh, channel. Um, Thank you all for coming and thanks for sharing, of course, asking your questions. And uh, Michael, what a deep dive. I, I knew just the surface. I really did. I could sense a lot from the drawings, the meditation and the process. But uh, I do remember, was it at first you had a bus with Creative Vision Factory or no? Maybe we, I'm wrong. We have, well, we have an artist who, who really like loves buses. And we've, we've been like, a, really strong advocates for him to um, get like one of his bus wrapped. And then um, our, one of our, our neighbors here in, in the city of Wilmington is the artist Nancy Josephson. And Nancy, uh, when her and her husband, David Bromberg, who's the guitarist and violin maker, uh, when they were in Chicago, Nancy got really involved with like an art car community. And she had a kind of bedazzled old school bus that was, uh, Part of the used to be a part of the permanent collection of the Visionaire Museum in Baltimore, and so um, Nancy. Yeah, the, art, the, the art car community is quite interesting when yeah. they get together. These are Max. My poor son once came home from school when he was like eleven years old. My friend David was on here said, "Oh, Barry he used to do art lunches." My son came home. There were three art cars in the driveway. One had a nest on it. It was just wild. Um, it was some great, great memories. 
Uh, Michael, join us more often and you know share your thoughts. Um, your creative vision factory, that's, you know, that's a big thing in itself and so many other things you've done. It's sort of honored to have you speak here and thanks for sharing. Everybody keep coming back whenever you like, reach out to me. Next week, I think it's gonna be general sort of everybody sharing, email me if you'd like to, probably five or 10 minutes um, and maybe some discussion on some more larger general topics. Um, thanks again, Michael. And thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. And I, and I will, I already Instagrammed you, Michael. So I check out what you're doing.